Good morning, good morning, good morning. Yes, it's Michael E. Gerber, the wandering Jew and Rabbi Levi Kunin, the practicing Jew. And we're here another morning. And today for us, it's Tuesday. For you, it could be anything. Who knows? Who knows how this works? But it works. And evidently, we're getting through. Um, this morning, Levi Kunin, how are you? Baruch Hashem, Rebbe good to see you. <coughs> uh, praying for all of those who are going through great difficulties in their health right now. Hoping and praying that the miracle that I, we hear coming out of Israel may be for real. And there may be a, a quick uh, way to bring healing to everybody, even those who are in, in the advanced stages. So we're praying for the miracle and uh, good to see you again. Good to be here. Wonderful. And tell me about the miracle coming out of Israel. Well, there was an announcement yesterday that they discovered the antibody that's needed and it's gone through phase one testing. It's been very effective, not just to be able to uh, to prevent people from uh, receiving the coronavirus, but also for people who already have it and are in later stages. So this is a uh, very, very, very positive to hear. And it's beautiful to see once again, the as a practicing Jew, the fulfillment of the Torah, the Torah's prophecy that says you shall be a light unto the nations. Because surely if they're going to discover it, it's going to be something that we made available to the, to the friends of the Jews. And guess what? You know who else is going to end up getting it also? <laughs> <laughs> the ones who want to destroy us. Go figure. That's how it works. You know, but, uh, but, but you know, like the Rebbe taught us, a little bit of light dispels a great deal of darkness. Wonderful. That's wonderful. So let's go back to why I'm here. I just remembered it, and I remembered it uh, strangely in a dream. Um, I was sleeping, <laughs> and I was dreaming, and I remembered what prompted this whole conversation. And I um, suggested to you that um, it would make great sense for me to go out to, um, I'll call them wandering Jews, secular Jews, all of the Jews in every community who don't respond um, to the um, outpouring of the shluchim, the rabbis of the Chabad houses in those communities, and speak to them from a different perspective. And you just brought up that perspective, a light under the nations. Um, and it just was very, very timely because it, shared with me something we spoke about briefly yesterday about the history of the Jewish people. And you suggested that I go on uh, Chabad.org and I discover um, more about um, uh, Mr. Wein, W-E-I-N, who's written a history of the Jews in six books. And I recall, uh, Levi, this is how, um, <laughs> how, uh, I don't even know if the word is obscene, um, a wandering Jew can be, I forget everything, more so of late than ever before. And when I say I forget everything, I forget everything of my past. Literally everything of my past. Um, I forget the name of relatives, I forget the names of my grandparents, I forget the names of um, anybody and everybody in my past, completely forget that. And not only that, but forget people I met in business. I forget people I've spoken to as recently as a year ago. Um, they're complete darkness to me. I absolutely have no recollection of any of them. And then they can repeat to me um, how we met, how we talked, what we talked about, um, how it inspired them or not, or whatever it was. But I'm hearing this whole uh, uh, dialogue about um, what we touched upon in our meeting. And I'm sitting here just absolutely shocked how completely absent all of that is from me. To the point where I was going to call my sister Leah, she's my older sister, and just ask her about our childhood um, because she remembers everything. And I remember nothing, and we don't have a relationship. 
Um, for whatever reason, it just, it's just, I don't have a relationship with most of the people in my family. <laughs> well, if I don't remember them, how could I possibly have a relationship with them? But hear me, it's, it's not laughable. It's in one sense tragic, in another sense, um, brooks a whole different conversation that I'm sure we could have. But in a dream, I remembered um, this conversation with you. The conversation with you was that um, while every shliach um, has it as his divine purpose to reach out to every Jew in their community, in their, I'll call it their marketplace, within the perimeters of their Chabad house, that so many of them that I've met in the work that we were doing, where I'd meet every week with all of the shlokim who were interested in organizing the Chabad house to grow, uh, interested in the whole e-myth thing, how small they all were. Um, there are exceptions to that, and that is the Chabad houses that have grown quite dramatically. But how small most of them are. They reach a certain limit, and then they don't get any more, don't attract more Jews to them. And I thought that um, it would be perhaps a, a best use of my time if I were to create a way to attract Jewish business owners in a Chabad community to become interested in Chabad. That's how all this started. I don't know whether you remember this. Of course. Yeah, and um, that's why I thought this conversation we'd have would be a good vehicle for that, but I completely forgot the starting of it. I forgot the reason we were having this conversation. And that's what I, why I brought in I Forget Everything. Well, first of all, I, I, want, I want to just intercede for a moment. It reminds me of a story of two, <laughs> wait, two, two women. Wait, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Lady, every single time <laughs> we have this conversation, I start something and you say it reminds me of a story. Every single time. There's a reason on, for that. Please. I learned it from Stories my Rebbe. always fascinating. I learned it from my Rebbe's. So it reminds me of a story of two elderly women that every morning at eight o'clock, they used to take a walk on the boardwalk in Miami. And one day after 20 years, they're both up there in their years. One of them turns to the other and says, she starts to cry. She says, why are you crying? She says, I want to ask you a question, but I'm so embarrassed. She says, we're such good friends. Why don't you, why don't you just ask me and I'll tell you. So don't worry about it. I don't be offended by anything. And she looks at her. She says, could you please... Remind me your name. So now her friend starts to cry. She says, you told me you're not going to get offended. So finally she looks back at her. She says, could you give me like 24 hours? <laughs> so you, it always reminds you of the story. <laughs> you know, I want to tell you, it's something so interesting in Kabbalah. Um, there, the difference between holiness, uh, one, of the, one of the places where you find a distinction between holiness and unholiness is forgetfulness is associated with unholiness. Unholiness. Remember, unholiness and remembering is associated with holiness. Mm -hmm. And we all have that phenomena in one way or another. It expresses itself in different ways. The only reason why we could be so... Uh, and one way distant from that true space within us is because we all forgot, you know? And if we were just to remember, when you read history, it's some level of memory that it gets awakened within us. Um, but, uh, but it's much deeper than that. But, it's a, but when we, you know, there's, there's ways that we engage that therefore we remember, you know? So I just wanted to put that out there to you. Well, that makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm saying it's, it's, you know, let me just say the following is that, the, the, there's a force out, there's a real force out there. Where, when we talk about we want Mashiach now, and what we're really saying is we want the lights to go on. 
if all humanity were able to see that bigger than our differences is the one force that is in and everything. And although our minds right now don't wrap itself around that, that's okay. That's because we're in the darkness. We're in the concealment. So we say we want Mashiach now. We're asking that, okay, we did our work to unveil that light. Now, Hashem, you do your part and release the chains and release the, the iron curtain that's not letting us see the truth right before our eyes, you know? So we're, we're, there's real forces out there. There's a real force out there that attempts to get us, and it's a real force that's talked about in our teachings, that tends to take us away from that which is in the most internal part of our heart. It's, that's what's it, and the and the Alter Rebbe and Tanya says we should look at it. He says from the Kabbalah, an example. We should look at it as if imagine a king who had an only son, and he put him at you know as he really loves o, o, the only son, and the old, only son is looking like he's going to be good royalty, but now the king wants to test him, and he goes to a woman who's part of his household, who's married, she's beautiful. He says, "I want you to test my son to act like a harlot." And while she's doing everything to listen to the command of the king, she's at the same time, everybody loves the son. She's praying he doesn't fall for her. So the, the, the Kabbalah tells us that when we get present to what the darkness and the forces that are doing, we should see it in that light. It's doing its job right now. Our job is to push through the light. We're in the, we're in the process of a birthing right now. And by us not allowing those obstacles to get in our way, and just to find mechanisms to, re, to get to get present now, to remember now, then we're not supposed to really be feeling bad about what happened or what we don't remember. You know, we just realize it's just part of the, the battle that's out there right now. You know, it's for real. It's, it manifests itself in the most real ways. It's a different and a longer conversation, but it's so for real. It's right before our eyes. The dishonesty, the dishonesty amongst our leaders and the pathetic fighting going on during this time of an epidemic, you know, it's like a pandemic I'm saying an epidemic. Yeah, it's an epidemic also. I just made that word up. Anyway, the point is that, um, that that's part of, you know, what you're going through, we're all going through in some way, you know, and that's why uh, when we, we pray in our prayers, we, we use the word to remember. We ask Hashem to remember. We're really asking ourselves to get present to our own memory, you know. So I don't know whether it's a spiritual condition or a physical condition. Well, you surely want to check out the physical condition. And I will, and I will tell you that, uh, that you, should, you should know that I'm happy to send you some songs, but their music is very much attached to awakening the uh, vibrations of memory. It's a science thing that they discovered recently. Um, so... Uh, Maybe it's time to get back to the saxophone, Reb Mikhail. <laughs> Maybe you'll play for us over here. I'll send you a, a, a tune from the Alta Rebbe. Maybe you'll play for us a song. Um, Please, but the same, it, but, that, that, that's very strange that you're saying that because my wife said that at dinner last night. Oh, my gosh. Look yeah, at that. She said that at dinner last night, and I had a dream before she said that. And the dream was I went and picked up my saxophone. Oh my gosh. Which, which I have not played for a long time. Three times, you know what three times in Torah is? No. Three times means it's an established fact. Hmm. I once learned, I once learned a, a, a teaching from the Rebbe that really changed my life, where the Rebbe said, you know, everything is divine providence. Everything's happening for a reason, of course. That's the teachings of Hasidus at its essence. Nothing is happening by mistake. Even a leaf falling off of a tree. So at one time I learned a teaching, I've been looking to find it again, I learned it several years ago, it really changed my life, where the Rebbe said that sometimes divine providence throws it at you, boom, 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 to make sure that even if you're asleep, you'll be awake to it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes. It's like to help us to go, oh my God, don't, 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 don't let this one pass. You know what I mean? And I've had, so, my, own exper I had my own experiences of that. Um, I was going through a struggle or something without going into the details. But somebody spoke, this years ago, somebody spoke to me about it on Shabbat. Somebody spoke to me about it on Saturday night. And somebody spoke to me about it on Sunday morning. And I said, that's it. I take it, Hashem. I'm in. I'm going to make the change that you're asking me to do. You know? So let me tell you what the dream. Please. 
um, was. Um, the dream was that I was called, called to um, pick up my saxophone again. But in this case, I was called to pick up my saxophone again in a completely different way than I've done it. Rather than picking it up and playing music, I was to pick it up as when I was a boy, learning the saxophone from the very beginning and start to play scales and practice my scales every day without a concern for how I sounded. So there was no affect of my horn. It was not music, it was scales. And with scales is when I was a little boy starting to learn how to play the saxophone wow. with my saxophone teacher who took me up and down, up and down, up and down in a book called Close, which is a book of scales. And so I made a commitment in my dream that I would pick up my saxophone and I'd practice my scales every day. I wouldn't practice music. I practice my scales like a blank piece of paper in beginner's mind um, want to say, I'd begin all over again. I wouldn't begin at the end of, I'd begin at the beginning of. And what would happen from that, who knows? That's what I was called to do. So I told that story to Luz Delia after she told me, you have to get back to your music. And um, I said, it's, it's strange. You're I want to tell you, I did not, I want to just give you a, I did not uh, talk to Luz Delia. So I had no information about that. Oh, I know you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I know you didn't. Well, that's um, fascinating, Ramachal. I, I will tell you that, um, first of all, what, what I'm receiving from your dream, one thing, besides the fact that that's such a beautiful lesson so deeply and on many levels, it's interesting how the question that we've been going through in the last several times is, you know, okay, I hear, Rabbi Levy, what you're saying, but how did, you know, I, 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 I don't have the discipline for what you're talking about. Yeah. And, in your, and when your dream you are shown how you actually did have the discipline because when you learn scales, it's not doesn't have the pleasure of learning music, of course. It's a discipline in a much greater sense than when you're playing a song. Yeah. But at the same time, it's a foundation of playing songs. It's a foundation for everything. It's a foundation for everything. So, wow, that's such a powerful. And I want to share with you also, in Kabbalistically, that the spirit of music is one of the highest forms of transmission of energy. It's actually higher than words. So we talked about in the past of the power of words and letters, but actually the power of tune is, is, is actually even higher than words. And in fact, that's why the tune in the Torah is so important. Because more than the words telling the story, the tune tells the story. And let me demonstrate that to you very simply. If I read the word Michael with an exclamation mark, it means one thing. If I read Michael with a question mark sound, it means something else. The same exact word means two different things because of what? Because of the tune. So therefore, there's a transmission of energy that transcends language and therefore has very, very great powers to it that therefore was used in the Holy Temple for over 800 years during the times of sacrifices very much to do with the ascent that it allowed for. And I'm so glad that uh, Hashem has brought music back into your life. <laughs> there are no mistakes. Huh? What, what I would like to do is I'd like to send you a, a, uh, a tune that uh, the first Chabad Rebbe taught. And he said to us that it was actually one of the tunes that was played in the Holy Temple every day when it stood gloriously on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. May it be rebuilt in our times. Mm. Wonderful. It's a beautiful tune, so I'm happy to Wonderful. share that with you. So, so thank you for that. So let me um, ask you then um, the question. Um, do you remember that um, thought of mine um, at the very beginning of this? 
in the beginning of our current uh, back and forth? Yes. Yes, but before I do, I want to ask you a question because Jews ask a question, answer a question with a question. I noticed a huge, 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 huge difference in your in your setup today. You know that. All right. I noticed a huge, huge difference in your yeah, setup. The Rebbe's, the Rebbe's picture isn't there. Could you share that with me what your inspiration was? Um, well, it wasn't inspired. It was um, due to a comment. And um, a number of people have commented about the picture. And I explain who it is. And one comment was uh, uh, leading to a conversation we were about to have with the executives of a one of the three largest real estate companies in the world. And they said, we would suggest you take the picture down. And the reason you take the picture down is because it's an absolute distraction from whatever conversation you're having, because someone obviously then says, so who's that? Because it's so obvious, so clear. And then we have to then, we have to, we don't have to, but then I'm called to explain who that is. And that then takes up about 20 minutes of the conversation. And so we're completely off the point. Do you know why I'm laughing so much? Why? Because I noticed that the first day, because when I'm looking at you, I'm looking at that the whole time. <laughs> I, was just, I, was, I just decided, Hashem, I'm going to wait till it comes to Michael. I know the day is coming. It's just a question of time. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that <laughs> as we started, because I always put it back up. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, because I say I forget things, yeah. <laughs> those are one of the things I forgot. <laughs> so I forgot to put it up this morning. It is always there when we speak. It's always there when I speak 99% of the time. And it was simply that one moment that I took it down for that one reason. And, um, but here we are. And it, it's listen, absolutely listen, true. I, I want to tell you something. I, 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 I want to tell you something. I would, I, I would say to that the Rebbe, would uh, have probably agreed if I would have shown, like, in, in my opinion, okay, it's only my opinion, but if the Rebbe would have watched our, our, our first episodes and saw that, I, I, I would imagine the Rebbe would say, you know, better put a small picture on your desk. Don't have that there, especially if you're trying to represent the wandering Jew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here you are. Here you are talking as a wandering Jew, and you got this big picture of the Rebbe right behind you. <laughs> this is my proof that Hashem, our maker, has an unbelievable sense of humor. And I mean that. And sometimes he gives us the possibility to laugh. <laughs> oh, maybe. Sometimes. <laughs> maybe. maybe. So we're already I was sitting here. I, I swear before you said that, I was sitting here asking myself, I wonder, I looked, at, I saw that when we started, and I realized I never have that up when we talk. I have yeah. the reference picture. Yeah. And I wondered um, why you didn't notice it after I noticed it. But you did notice it. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want. I didn't want to distract your 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 talk and your message. No, so but please, but, but, no, but here, everything's okay here. I got it. I got it. Everything's I'm, okay here. But because my my memory of how we began this was the fact that there's a great distance in the conversation between uh, people who have not experienced uh, a uh, observant Torah life and people that are living Torah observant lives. And unfortunately, there's too much uh, dialogue and narrative out there that's completely inconsistent with truth. And there are shows that are out there that represent, you know, certain things that bring about a greater divide. And our conversation was, how do we get the conversation going beyond the differences, beyond the fact that, you know, and that was, I, that was, I, I understand uh, our init initial engagement in this platform to lend itself to others that may not be comfortable to ask certain questions, or may not feel, you know, may, may, or may feel so distant from p talking to someone who's a shliach uh, or a shlucha because, ah, they're so different than me. 
and and vice versa. People who may be uh, observant Jews who may be watching this and seeing like there's such a distance between why would I talk to them about something that we have completely two different worlds about, and it's not necessarily true. So that's what my, that's what I thought it was, but who knows. I guess we should have listened to your advice and wrote it down. <laughs> yeah, it would have been best. But yeah. actually, um, uh, my thought was we would begin to do it and it would take on a form. Um, and that form would be derived from uh, the responses we get to it. But we have yet to invite people to um, respond to us. Correct. Um, and that... Um, invitation has never been given, nor are we set up to receive those um, responses, um, meaning there's not a chat um, box that we have here that they can then say, what about, what about, what about, so forth and so on. And at the same time, the venue, I call the venue 20 minutes. We're almost out of our 20 minutes right now. We're, we're, we're at 27. Yeah. Um, our venue doesn't allow that because how could we then also engage with questions that people ask? Um, so we have to sit down, you and I, and do some constructive work about that. And so I'll say to everybody who's listening right now, um, every one or two of you, whoever you might be, um, my sister maybe, um, who are listening to us right now, um, to write me, uh, michael at michaelegerber.com, or to write Rabbi Levi Kunin at... Rabbi at jewishmalibu.com. And um, then ask any questions you have. And we won't use your name. Um, and we'll find a way to respond. And we simply might respond by email. We might respond by a phone call. We might respond however you'd like us to respond. Um, we're completely open about that. Are you open about that, Levy? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And we can discuss off air what we could do. Listen, I, all I could say is that I'm, I intend, and those of you who are watching this moment, and we did this, we already did a whole bunch of shows beforehand. I intend, number one, I already put up that web page where I'm going to upload the later episodes, but I intend to make this, God willing, something that will be part of a process if somebody wants to learn about, about uh, you know, the conversation between. I think I, I have, uh, I look forward to putting it in that format so it could be of benefit for people that in the future have a, a desire to learn more, but maybe before they want to come talk to our rabbi, they want to see what that experience may feel like, may look like, you know, so. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very positive about the, that which um, has come up in our conversations. I think it's very useful to people. I hope and pray that is. And, uh, and I really hope that you know, our brothers and sisters that are watching this will get engaged in some way, wake up in their desire to get connected to something that's so important to their past and their present, more importantly, the present. So that's the deal. Wonderful. And well, do an act of goodness and kindness. Time. What's that? Way over time. So way over time. So, <laughs> so Rabbi Kunin, thank you very much for this morning. All right. Thank you, Rabbi Michal. And every one of you, thank you for being here. Um, you can see that I'm looking at you again. I've been looking at Rabbi Kunin on my screen, and my wife keeps on saying, Don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And I continue to do that, do that, do that. We'll see you again tomorrow. Bye bye.